Um, we will get into the second session of the first day of the Alice Congress. We will be looking now at um, towards uh, intelligent management of uh, landscapes, and we will be looking at um, the, model is, uh, the modelization of uh, ecosystem services. Our first speaker is, uh, will be Alba Marquez from the BC3, and Alba will be talking about the modelization of uh, pasture land and cattle. Um, so Alba, uh, it's all yours now. I think you have your screen already connected and you could start to share with us your presentation. Uh, hello everyone, um, my name is Arwa Market and I'm going to explain the adaptation of Porto model white right at DNR language to Kim language of KLAP in order to do the pasture land and nice and livestock model uh, accessible, interoperable and user friendly. Uh, the Porto model was developed on the Center of Agricultural Research. Alba, eh, necesitamos que compartas la, la pantalla y que pongas el PPT en vez de la, el streaming de YouTube. Ahora, ahora está Sorry. bien, perfecto. The Puerto Model... The Puerto model was developed at the Center of Agriculta for Agricultural Research and Training of Cantabria by Dr. Juan Busque as part of his research on the structure, growth and utilization of pastures in the Cantabrian grassland. Puerto is an empirical dynamic model based on established biophysical relationships between vegetation's life cycle, including growth, senescence, death and litterfall, livestock grazing process, including livestock ingestion, digestion, excretion, and weight change, and the nitrogen cycle, including nitrogen uptake, soil cycling, and leaching, all of them under the influence of the climatic conditions. The main reason to incorporate Puerto model to Alice project was that among the different models that we had to build for the project, the Puerto model was given an answer to a three of the terrestrial models at the same time, pasture land management, nitrogen leaching, and meat production. And moreover, Puerto was built for the particular cases of extensive agricultural systems and mountain pastures, the same framework that we have in the case studies. So why we add Puerto to Caleb? Although its reliability and usefulness have been validated and improved over the years, this model is essentially inaccessible to non-programming specialists, and Cantabrian land managers must rely on technical consultancies to use it. Further, Puerto has always been used in isolation, never contributing to more comprehensive computational modeling workflows. And this one of the one this is one one this is, was one of the principles of Alice project, the interaction between the models. To add the model, written in R to do the Kim language, we change the type of the language, the workflow distribution, and we modify the input data system from non-spatial to spatially explicit. On the left side, you can see the workflow of Puerto model with the main parts of the model, and on the right, part of the R code, composed of al almost 1,500 lines of code into 13 script files. Some of the main limitations was that it's monolithic and cumbersome, which makes it difficult to understand its computational workflow. The model's interface is not user-friendly, and it is only usable by advanced R users. It is like transparency in the definition of multiple parameters, which lack semantics and appear as acronym defined as fixed values in the code. Another key of the adaptation of Puerto to KLAB was achieve the FAIR criterion making the models, results, and its use more accessible for non-technical users as farmers and policymakers, 
And in the case of Puerto, the code and the data are not developed as findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The adaptation of Puerto, it operates under the KLAB open source software platform and Kim semantic annotation and modeling language. Also, focus on making it interoperable, the new Puerto is part of ARIES, an open source platform for interoperable models and data, backed by international and multidisciplinary community to address a wide range of sustain sustainability problems. The adaptation of Puerto model to KLAB is now open and online as per print. For the adaptation of Puerto, first, we redesigned the whole workflow distributing the different models under 10 thematic namespaces that describe the, intera the interactions between vegetation, animals, and their environment, as you can see on the left. On the right, you can see part of the Kim code in the K-modeler. The differences between the two types of code are clear. While the code is in R is based on parameters and variables written as a acronym not understandable except by the author, the semantic code of Kim is perfectly understandable even for a non-modeling person, as it has as self-explanatory variables names. Moreover, the KLAB model can run independently, while for R it's impossible to run only part of the code as independent model because as, monolith as monolithic code structure, the rest of 100 1,400 lines are needed. So its namespace is composed of several model components that each describe one concept involved in the logical structure for a total of 198 models that are logically consistent, self-contained, and can run independently, unlike Puerto's original monolithic structure. Some of the main characteristics, characteristics are that generates spatially explicit outputs at user-specific temporal and spatial scales. Open source data from global to local scale with different temporalities can be complement the model when local parameters are missing, such as the raster data describing soil texture. Semantics are used to annotate all resources and model components using a well-established and expert-vetted vocabulary. Models are interoperable and independent. K-Lab is powered by artificial intelligence and in particular by machine reasoning. The modeling approach is modular by design, parsimonious and logically consistent, which make the knowledge contained in the resources unambiguously and more transparently and shareable, while making the model more accessible for non-technical users. Moreover, outputs include multiple open source models, algorithms and spatial outputs of primary interest to pastoral managers. Among all the components of the KLAP ecosystem, I want to highlight a explorer. The models, algorithms, data sources, and results are accessible to non-technical users through this web browser application, KN users feature of the KLAP modeling environment, an essential improvement from the previous edition of the Puerto model, which is only available to technical models proficient in the R programming language, as I said before. The main Puerto outputs are produced in our tables associated with each, manage, with each management unit of Pastorland. Here, there is an example. These four maps generated in the K-Lab show the same information as the R table, but adding essential information such as the spatial distribution of the results, which helps to the stakeholders to interpret the output model and take decisions. Moreover, only the code the developers knows what means the acronym used to identify the output of the model, as for example, come in the second column. That is the code of the main vegetation, which is the code itself. Both the data sources and the algorithms used as input for the results are autom automatically generated and are publicly available and the output map is downloadable. Another improvement for a user is the dynamic and open workflow, which is built on the fly. On the right, the figure shows the static workflow of the original Puerto that we saw before. And on the left, the interactive data flow of the requested model created by KLAB that is built on the fly. So it changes depending on the running of any of the 198 models. Thus, the K-Explorer workflow shows all the model and the depend dependencies. By clicking on each block of the data flow, more information is provided, describing the resources with basic information about the data source. This is based on metadata contributed by users who have previously contributed data 
data resources to the KLAM network, including links back to the original data source. For table, its table's composition, and in the case of parametrized models, as Puerto, the expression or algorithms used. Finally, a printable report is also created on the fly, collecting documentation from each model, being run and, ad and adapting it to the results being calculated. Basic documentation about each model component is added by each model's contributor in the K-Lab, which is called when the model is run. This reporting facility, uh, this reporting facility that complements the workflow graph in making the system transparent and readable. The report follows the standard structure of a scientific article, which is, includes introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusion, and references. It can include tables, figures, or other elements, depending on the model, and can be downloaded in PDF format. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Alba, for such an interesting talk um, about pasture land and cattle modeling. Um, we will move into the next talk. Um, this talk is gonna be given by Alexia Gonzalez Ferreras. Uh, she's part of the Environmental Hydraulic Institute um, uh, team. And she will be talking about models that we develop uh, for water quality and fish biomass. All yours, Alexia. Thanks. So um, I'm going to talk about the change in water quality and fish biomass, uh, the influence of global change and implementation of blue-green infrastructure networks. So as a little background, uh, river ecosystems provide multiple uh, ecosystem service. So here we are going to focus um, in provisioning and regulating ecosystem service. Uh, specifically, we are going to focus on fish production and the regulation of, of water quality. There are several variables that can influence or affect uh, both fish production and water quality. Um, the most important variables are related to the climate and land use and land cover. So the change or the variation that can produce, uh, for example, a uh, climate change or land use land cover, both natural or anthropogenic variation, uh, can produce change in the fish production and water quality. So the objective of this study is to estimate the change in water quality and fish biomass across at least case studies, think, taking into account uh, different simulation scenarios. Specifically, we are going to take into account three scenarios. Uh, the first one is the current situation. The second one is in the future, like a, a business as usual, the BAU scenario. And the third one is an implementation of blue-green infrastructure networks, so the BG scenario. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we are going to analyze the four case studies of, of Alice projects. Uh, several speakers uh, have uh, been talking about this, so I'm going to, to say only the main difference between them. So there are differences uh, related to the pressures or the topography. For example, the Spain's catchments uh, are located in a coastal and mountain area uh, where the principal pressures are related to fire, overgrazing, and also uh, hydraulic infrastructures in the river. Uh, the France catchment are located in a more uh, flat area where the main pressures is related to, to agric agricultural practice. 
The Portugal catchment is, mean, is mainly affected by urban areas and also there are a huge extension of eucalypt, eucalypt uh, forests. And finally, the North Island uh, catchment is also uh, affected by urban and agricultural practice. So here uh, we are going to follow the model integration uh, followed by the ALICE project. So specifically we are going to focus in the biophysical models part and also in the results. So our objective is to get the values or the variables related to phase biomass and, and water quality and to do that we are going to, to follow a multimodal uh, approach framework. So in the first place uh, we use several uh, climate and land use land cover variables uh, that were implemented in, the, in a hydrological model and a water temperature model which results uh, all together with several variables like barriers, effluents and so on were also uh, used as input in several Bayesian belief networks to get uh, the outputs and also these same outputs were used like inputs uh, and at the end we get the phase biomass and also different water quality variables. Here we are going to focus in five variables that are the water uh, temperature, the load of solids in uh, the suspended solids and nitrates and phosphates and also the, the percentage of the relative abundance of EPT that is uh, Femeroptera, Plecoptera and Trichoptera taxa and finally in the fish biomass. So also we are going to focus in the three uh, scenarios. So this is our, the first results related to, to water temperature where we can see uh, the different values in the first case studies related to average summer's water temperature. And here we can see that in the first case studies the temperature in the bow scenario is higher uh, reg uh, related uh, is higher regarding to the to the current scenario. Uh, France and Portugal are the catchments with the higher temperatures, but Spain and North Ireland are the catchments where this increase in temperature is higher. In France, North Ireland and Portugal we can see how the Beijing and Bau values are uh, equal or the same. This is because this variable depends on an air temperature and forest. And in these three case studies, the, incre the increase in forest for the Beijing scenario is less than 2%. So the chains are not, uh, are not notorious for, for this catchment. But in the case of Spain, we can see that the increase in forest in the Beijing scenario is higher. In some of the subcatchment analyzed, is more than 40%. So, as the water temperature depends on the forest, we can see how the average summer water temperature in the Beijing scenario uh, decreases uh, regarding to the bow scenario. And in some of the points analyzed, this value is. is uh, is until a uh, 30% of, of the grass. So it's a very important uh, variable, the forest, since uh, this dumping the, the water temperature of the river. So here we can see the results uh, related to, to water quality, uh, analyzing the lots of phosphates, nitrate, and suspended solids in, in low flow, so in summer. We can see uh, three classes of water quality, high, medium, now low. The high water quality is related with low loads of, of these three elements. And on the contrary, the low water quality is related with high loads of these three elements. Here we can see um, like a, a, a rectangle or a box when we can see in the, in the horizontal lines the three scenarios and in the vertical lines the three elements analyzed. So these variables depend on the catchment area, the percentage of urban and, and forest and also the number of effluents. And here we can see how the low water quality are uh, mainly in the mouth of the catchment and also in the, in the middle part while the high and medium uh, values of the water quality are more represented in the headwater and, and, and the middle part. 
catchments like France and North Ireland, where the agricultural effects are, are really high, we can see how uh, the, the values of low water quality for the three elements uh, are, are in red and also um, are equal for, for the three scenarios. While, for example, in Spain and Portugal, the more forested uh, areas, we can see how bow and Beijing scenarios can improve the water quality uh, above all in the headwater areas. Here we can see the relative abundance of highly sensitive uh, Femeroptera, Plecoptera and Tricoptera taxa. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, three classes. The high water quality is related with a high percentage of abundance of, of this taxa. And this variable depends on nitrates, suspended solids, water temperature and riparian forest. Here we can see that in the mouth or lower part of the catchment there are a high water quality well, in the, in the middle and headwater parts of the catchment, there are more uh, medium water quality. Uh, in all the catchment, in the headwater, uh, regarding the three scenarios, is more or less uh, stable or equivalent the water quality. But in the case of Spain, when in headwaters and Beijing and Bau is more forested, we can see how the, the water quality improves. And finally, we are going to analyze the salmonids biomass. When we say salmonids biomass, we refer to the biomass of adults uh, that are together the trout and salmon species where, where is present. And there are three classes, high, medium and low biomass. And these variables depend on the channel width, the barriers present on the river network, the water temperature and the O2 concentration. Here we can see a similar pattern for the four case studios where the high biomass is uh, mainly present in the principal axis, the medium biomass in the middle part of the catchment and the low biomass in the headwaters. This is because uh, the higher biomass is represented by the big individuals and this need space and, and more habitat that is uh, found in the, in the main axis. Spain and French skies studio uh, present uh, more of the river length with high biomass, uh, will North Ireland present uh, most of the length of the river network with, with medium class, and Portugal uh, present uh, most of the river network with low biomass. Uh, regarding the bow and beginning scenarios, we are going uh, to analyze only the case of, of Portugal, of, of France catchment, because uh, this catchment, uh, as we can see when we analyze the water temperature, uh, this catchment presents the higher values of temperature. And this is the most important variable for the salmonid biomass. So here we can see how in the bow and beginning scenarios, most of the high biomass of salmonids uh, goes to the medium and low and low class. So we can see how the biomass is reduced uh, mainly by the increase of water temperature and also by the, the O2 uh, concentration. So as conclusion, we can see that uh, fish biomass and water quality are highly influenced by climate and land use land cover change. The implementation of regimes can improve the ecological integrity of aquatic ecosystems and partially reduce the effects of global change. And that model re results are very useful for understanding the potential change produced by global change and the implementation, the implementation of regimes on aquatic ecosystems, which is essential for their conservation and management. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Alexia, for, for your talk. Very interesting. And we're going to move into the next one now. Um, we have uh, now the contribution from Ferdinando Villa and Stefano Balbi from the BC3. And, uh,
And it's going to be you presenting, I guess. Sí, ya han empezado ellos. Okay. So, here we are. Uh, I'll let you to it then. Um, hello. Uh, I guess I guess everybody is hearing uh, my voice. I'm Stefano Balbi. I am uh, a researcher at the Basque Center for Climate Change, and uh, I've been coordinating um, our work in the Alice Project, which. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry about that. So uh, thank you to everybody who is uh, joining us for the live broadcast. And also I would like to express my gratitude to the interpreters who are, I guess, making a, a huge work, especially in translating non-native speaker like myself. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, Again, uh, so I will be talking mainly about modeling and uh, interoperability and model integration. So since the, um, since the inception of the project, trying to go to the next slide, um, the, we, we had in mind uh, uh, to work on multiple ecosystem services and on multiple uh, modeling. Uh, so the idea of having a multimodal platform and uh, and different uh, problems to model. Why? So the reason is that um, basically, uh, what is intelligent planning for nature-based solution? Uh, the idea of uh, studying uh, the impact of B genes uh, before they are implemented, because basically B genes are uh, uh, very useful but they might have uh, trade-offs on different aspects of uh, social ecological systems. And so it's very important to, to understand uh, the expected consequences of implementing the genes. Um, and that's uh, the way to do it is to try to employ simulation models of different components. Um, and that's what we are doing uh, in our uh, working package. Our objective was to take all the modeling produced in the project and put it together in, uh, in, uh, in one simulation platform, which is Caleb, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, I, I'm mainly talking about the, the simulation part. Uh, there is also a very important component about um, the involvement of different stakeholder groups and the modeling of the social uh, components, including different... Uh, perspective and values on B genes, uh, but there will be colleagues expanding on that in, uh, in the later um, presentations. So I will be mainly focusing on the, on the quantitative modeling part. So uh, we use the, na the narrative uh, of ecosystem services uh, mainly to refer to the fact that we are addressing uh, uh, social ecological systems where there is social component and a natural component. But um, Alice was born with this idea of addressing different realms like uh, rivers, uh, terrestrial ecosystems, uh, estuarine uh, ecosystems, and the, and the idea of not only having the ecosystem part well uh, represented, but also the social part well represented so that mm, we are able to capture the fact that nature is providing uh, benefits to human societies and, and uh, human societies are co-producing these benefits, so in, in, but also producing uh, side effects to nature, as everybody knows. Um, so the, the main idea here is that there doesn't exist one approach to uh, model everything, but that we need interoperability, so different modeling components to be able to represent this complexity. And uh, how do we do that? Um, so we have a long history uh, of applying a branch of artificial intelligence, uh, and in particular machine uh, reasoning and semantics. So semantics is really to explain, uh, to define um, models in a, a machine-readable way. 
and uh, and um, and the machine reasoning is meant to be able to compose uh, modeling components in a way uh, to respond to user queries. Um, that is a combination of uh, as, uh, an as assembling all the modeling components that can answer to a particular user query. So on the one end, we have semantics to explain machines what the models are. On the other end, we have machine composing all the modeling components to respond to user queries. And not only we produce uh, model uh, so maps, but also reports. Uh, and uh, obviously, we document all the modeling workflows like um, Alba was showing before. And um, so this is the, um, let's say the problem to, to model all the different components of the ecosystems. And uh, how did we do that? Well, uh, let's say we started with the models that we, we had already in our portfolio. So recreation, um, flood, carbon, these were taken care of already before the, the project started. And then we de we developed more models, uh, data-driven models uh, about uh, agricultural production and, for example, fire uh, ignition probability. Um, we developed the further uh, data-driven model specific for the Alice project. So this is related, for example, to what Alexia has just presented. But in general, everything related to water quality, all the um, um, river network uh, base part, so uh, suspended solid, uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, oxygen, concentration, and loads. And uh, these were done basically using data-driven models uh, based on databases uh, specific for the ALICE uh, project. Um, we re-implemented uh, existing models. This is, for example, the case of the Puerto model that Alba was explaining before. And there were other models, like the hydrological model and the water temperature model, that were loosely coupled, meaning that we took the output from those models and, uh, and linked them to, to the K-Lab models. So uh, it's, it's a lot of modeling, uh, a lot of different models coming together in one platform. Uh, the main message of this slide is that basically using uh, between 15 and 20 input variables, uh, we were able to resolve around 40 unique outputs uh, of uh, different kind of outputs that, as you saw before. Um, so that that means that basically we have uh, covered a lot of things. Um, like, um, for example, in climate, uh, for the climate part, uh, the, obviously we took into account as main drivers, precipitation and temperature during different seasons. And uh, in particular, we considered different uh, IPCC uh, scenarios, but the one with the uh, high emission levels, the RCP 8.5 was the one that we considered mainly for 2050. For land cover as well, uh, there was a presentation before about that. So we have uh, land cover simulated over time, but I mean, the, for example, the land cover classes considered are not so many. So with eight land cover classes, we were able to explain a lot of things. Then uh, there are key variables for, from the river network uh, um, part and then key variables from the hydrological and the water temperature part, and then some key variables from the estuarine part. And with these um, variables, let's say, these are the main drivers that allow us to explain a lot of dynamics, a lot of complexity um, that happen in social ecological systems uh, of the 4K studies that were covered by the um, ALICE project. So these are some uh, outputs. For example, on the left, top left side, you have the Pasmira zone case study with the solid uh, suspension uh, load. Um, on the top uh, right side, you have phosphorus uh, concentration in, in the French case study. In the bottom left side, you have the recreation uh, uh, map for the Northern Ireland case study. And in the bottom right part, you have um, flood risk for the Portuguese um, case study. So these are just some snapshots to give you an idea of 
uh, yeah, the maps and all, all the modeling outputs that were produced for, uh, for all the case studies using K-Lab. That is a network technology made of many components, uh, but here the key message is that we have a user interface for modelers, it's called K-Modeler, and that was already existing before the Alice project, but we didn't have a user-friendly um, user interface. Uh, and so uh, Alice was instrumental to develop the K-Explorer um, user interface, which is the user interface that allows people to uh, access modeling outputs in a user-friendly way. And, um, and this is basically a slide that wants to share with you a way, uh, the possibility to explore it and use it. So you can register at integratedmodeling.org slash hub, and then you can test it online without any download, just a, a web browser and a good internet connection at integratedmodeling.org slash modeler. There you have um, um, a user interface that is mainly based on a, a search bar that can be used to introduce uh, queries. Uh, um, ecosystem services related queries obviously are uh, predefined and ready to be used. And, uh, and that is um, a practical way to experience uh, the first uh, semantic web with, uh, made of uh, scientific knowledge. Um, one thing that I want to, to dive into the details a little bit more, it's about the data-driven models because these models were really um, used a lot in this project. So data-driven models means uh, models that uh, are uh, machine learned from, from data. In particular, we used a lot of uh, Bayesian belief networks, which is one particular class of uh, machine learning classifiers. And uh, the fact that we have a machine learning uh, engine with, um, that is Weka completely uh, integrated in the K-Lab um, software makes uh, the generation of these machine learning uh, models very easy uh, and easy to do them in a spatially explicit way. So there you have a way to declare the creation of, uh, of a model for, for example, for um, ecology, uh, the biomass of trees, uh, where basically you say, okay, I want to model the biomass of trees observing uh, a set of explanatory variables, and there you have them. And uh, for each of these explanatory variables, the system goes and picks the, the model that resolves them, probably a layer, a spatial layer, like a raster layer of uh, NDVI, for example, or, or uh, slope or elevation on aspect. And, uh, and the model is, is built automatically. Then when you build the model, you have a Bayesian network that is generated, which you can also modify according to expert um, knowledge. So you can modify the structure, but modify also the, the probability themselves. So it's a very powerful way of, of developing new models. Um, and yes, uh, they can be used to generalize patterns that are observed in specific case studies. Um, finally, uh, I want to share the main reference for all of these. So the, let's say the first reference is about the global models that were already uh, available in Arias before the, the project. Uh, then this methodology of learning models from data is uh, machine learning for ecosystem services. And if you feel like experiencing more about uh, this technology, please visit our website, integratedmodeling.org. Thank you very much. I hope I am within my time boundaries. And um, see you soon. Thanks a lot, Stefano. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, we're just going to move now into the last uh, talk of the day. Um, we have Nacho Perez with us. He will be talking about uh, how to design begins. So, Nacho. It's your turn. Thanks, Pepe, for your presentation. Uh, wait, sorry. This here. Aquí.
Okay. So, sorry. Hello, everyone. My talk is about the the conceptual and modeling framework, framework that we have developed in the Alice project in order to design the the functional and the structural part of the blue and green infrastructure network. So, because the concept of, of BGN, of blue green infrastructure network, is often ambiguous or at least quite broad, I would like to, to start the presentation defining which we have understood as a BGN in, in the context of, of Alice project. For this begin is basically is a landscape planning instrument. So it should have got all the properties or mechanisms to determine the spatial sonification and also to guide the, the management of, of our landscape. So uh, it, for this, we, we uh, furthermore, three uh, accomplished main features are, are required for this. Uh, the first is to be constituted constitute by nature-based solutions, so to use the properties of ecosystem and natural habitats in order to, to resolve some socio and environmental issues of the, of the catchment. Also to be a multifunctional uh, for responding a, a quite broad a, a list of ecosystem services and also to have an spatial currents, a connectivity, not only in terms of biodiversity, but also, but also in terms of um, functional connectivity between all their, their elements. The rationalization behind the blue-green infrastructure network concept would be basically as, as follows. For an ecosystem service or a group of ecosystem service, since they are in the landscape different areas that although they are potentially adequate to provide these ecosystem services, the habitat that produce or regulate it are in, in a bad a status of quality or simply they don't exist in the, in, the, in the landscape. So the level of provision of this ecosystem service is quite low. On the other hand, we also have on, in other areas of the, in, in the landscape that are uh, providing ecosystem services because the habitat involved in, in its generation are functioning properly. So us, as designers of, of uh, blue-green infrastructure networks, uh, try to, to, to maximize uh, that, uh, both areas to selecting uh, some of these but function, but functioning areas in the landscape to apply in in them solution of restoration for recover the the habitats that allow the provision of the ecosystem service, but also we need to preserve the other areas that now is well functioning and for providing these other ecosystem service that are providing the the, the habitats involved in in this uh, in this function. So. Uh, in order, all, all these, these managed areas that, that we call as functional hotspots uh, will be integrated into a broad context in which we create a, a network will constitute with all the, the different elements that constitute the, the begin. So according to, to my last slide, it is particularly important, which are the goals and the, and the target ecosystem service of our, of our BGIN. Because they will determine which areas and which habitats we need to, to empower it with the, with the design of the, of the BGIN. In this sense, it's, there is not an, a unique potential BGIN for each territory, because it depends on all the goals and the specific objectives that for which we are designing this, this blue and green infrastructure uh, network. For all this, it's very important uh, to, to integrate the participatory uh, processes involving local stakeholders in the definition of the begins, not only for the, 
for the uh, decision or, or to provide us the social demands that the stakeholders uh, want, but also to determine what of the scenarios that we can propose to the stakeholders would be more, more adapted to the views of these particular, uh, these particular groups. So after this brief introduction uh, about how we conceptualize in Alice in the, the begins, I'm going to present now how we implemented this methodology into the, the Alice uh, context, using as example the, our, scan, our study, the, the Spanish case study, sorry. As we can see in, in the roadmap that, that we have followed, we combine some uh, workshop with stakeholders, with modeling phases, in which we implement the decision and discussions taken in the, in the stakeholders' uh, forums. In the first stage of the design of the begin, we decide, together with our stakeholders, the main objectives of our, of our begin. In this sense, for example, the Spanish, in the Spanish case study, the beginning was focused on impro improving some regulation ecosystem service in order to reduce three, basically three environmental risks that are the erosion and, and soil loss, the uh, improved the hydrological regulation to, for preventing for flood, and flood uh, protection, and the, the fire risk. Mm, in this stage also, we, we select the nature-based solution that we were, were to apply in our landscape, in the functional, lands, in the functional hotspot of our landscape. Uh, for this, this nature-based solution are obviously linked to, to the physical processes that control the ecosystem services that we are considering, and also they are suitable to, to be implemented in our, in, in our case study. Uh, for example, in the case of, of the erosion, um, we choose uh, both hillside forests and riparian forests. Hillside forests, we choose hillside forests to prevent uh, of the erosion in the, in the south of the, of the erosion, and we choose the riparian forest that filters the sediment, avoiding their entry into the, the river uh, network. After, after this, after they, after make this selection with the, with the stakeholders, we are ready to, to model the interactions between the physical processes that we want to improve and the, and the ecosystem, ser uh, sorry, and the nature-based solution associated to these physical processes. In order to identify in the, in the landscape the different functional hotspots that, that we uh, need to restore or, or preserve. Following with the, with the example of the, of the erosion, we can see here in red areas in which we quantify uh, areas of high er erosion in which we will need to, apply, to apply, uh, as a decision, uh, nature-based solutions of restoration. And also we have another areas in green in which the high side forest, our high side forest, is preventing from the erosion, so we will select these areas for uh, conservation. At the, at the end of, of this uh, modeling stage, we, we need to, to set a different threshold for its physical processes in order to select the, 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 the core areas of our beginnings. So also in this, in this final process, we um, have also made some analysis, uh, connectivity analysis in order to, to find the linkers between these core areas and implement in our begin, begin design. In the final step, we, we implement these core uh, areas and, and linkers into our current uh, scenario of, of land cover in order to, to simulate the evolution of the, of, of, of the landscape to, to the future, so, sorry, to the future, to 2050. Uh, with this, we can, we can see how 
the, the, the landscape change, change not only by the landscape, historical landscape dynamic, but also because of the management practice that we have applied implementing the different nature-based solutions in our, in our case studies. So basis, basically, basically so sorry, this is the methodology that, that, you, that you have developed in Alice, and I'm, I would like to finish with uh, some concluding remarks. The first one is the, also the, the methods that uh, we applied in each case study are quite, uh, quite similar. The beginning scenarios are very different between, between the, the case study. And not only in terms of, of the percentage of the areas that will be included in like a uh, begin, but also because the different type of strategies are nature-based solution that each uh, uh, case study has choose. And that is, it confirms the, the flexible nature of, of these instruments and its, its ability to, to be adapted to different landscape and and, uh, and different realities. And the first and, and the last thing that I would like to to, to say it is that what we have uh, have uh, built is a begin, but a begin utopia because we only try to to maximize the the target of the ecosystem the target ecosystem service that we select, but without taking in account the influence over other land uses and their ecosystem service associated. So in order to, to bridge this gap uh, to, to a true application to uh, uh, the landscape, we, we need to, as following steps, we need to include the, uh, uh, consider uh, different relations in between the ecosystem service that we are uh, taking in account, the trade-offs, the synergies, in order to also identify the different barriers of implement implementation to these uh, instruments and tools for landscape uh, planning. So thanks very much for your attention, and we will see. Thanks a lot, Nacho, for your talk. Really interesting. Um, very interesting stuff combining all the different begins from all case studies. It's something that we hardly had uh, time to look at. So thanks a lot for all uh, sharing with us all these results and, and thoughts. Uh, we're basically now um, running out of time. We just uh, had uh, five or six minutes late from the schedule, which is not bad, uh, thinking on uh, all the technical solutions and <laughs> all the technical problems that, that we have for having everybody connected and translating uh, simultaneously. So I would really like to thank to all the technical engineers that we have in the room here and all the people that have been uh, making this possible, honestly. Uh, um, and now we will have to move into the time of questions and debate. So if you people out there uh, want to share some doubts, questions, impressions uh, with us, uh, please uh, use the chats available and we will make our effort to bring them to the different speakers that we have today. Um, I will be reading those questions so that we will have simultaneous translations and then we will hear the, the responses from the speakers. So do we have anything in there? Thank you, Pepe. Um, just a discussion, hopefully. Uh, we have been, I have been just sending some, um, some comments in the different languages of the chat that we have. And hopefully some questions uh, arise. But what, what we try to, to put on the table, at least, 
was um, not talking about the results. We have been listening quite a lot about the results, but talking about the complexities of these kind of data integration. So we have modelers talking about landscape dynamics, about biodiversity patterns, water quality, climate, ecosystem services, and, and quite, maybe all the different aspects related to, to landscape at different levels. So uh, at the end, Stefano and the people from Aries and BC3 told us about the data and model integration. So I wanted to just uh, maybe launch to Pepe as the coordinator of, of all the project and all of us have been working in everything almost, but uh, just having a, a, not an integrative modeling, but a, an integrative vision, how complex is this kind of data integration, model integration, people integration, perspectives integration, and stakeholder integration. So it looks sim simple and straight, but it is not. It, it is quite complex. It has been one of the main uh, goals and, and, um, and complexities of the project and how simple and how difficult it is, Pepe, and try to get more questions of all of you, please, in, the, in the, all the attendees. Uh, we put on the table this first discussion. <laughs> we will talk later, Jose. <laughs> uh, I think it's a really uh, a nice, nice, really nice question, Jose, and, and, and I think it's one of the lessons that I've learned, or w I think we all share this and, and learn it through, the, through Alice, the hard way, you know, like uh, just trying to make it happening. And Honestly, I think one of the most difficult things, I know that the integration of modeling is a nightmare and maybe Stefano Ferdinando can talk about all that because, because I know they've been, it's quite painful and, and we've been suffering a lot in the last weeks, months to get all these results. But um, apart from that, which is a huge effort and apart from developing the models and apart from the stakeholder participation process, I think one of the most important things for me has been, um, and I think it's, a, it's, it's one of these good things of having a nice, a, a big project, a large project as this one is, trying to combine the visions. The visions that are generated from the different localities and the different experiences as well. It is really difficult, or I find that it's really difficult to uh, have a common language. And although water means water, uh, the, 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 the meaning behind the word water, it might have completely different um, thinking in different parts of, of the world and in different minds and in different professions. So for an engineer, water is one thing. For an ecologist, water is a completely different thing. But water might be different in Northern Ireland than here or how they understand it or how they use it. And this means that we need to spend a lot of time together. Uh, we need to, st to spend a lot of time talking, sharing, and communicating. And I think Alice has been really good for that. I think this has been a, a problem from the actual COVID is not having this Congress together so that all this sharing of knowledge, all this communication could actually be taken to the last stage, which uh, I think we will need to do it at some stage. So the integration of visions of human communities, I think is really, really important to be able to uh, talk the same language. And for that, we need to spend a lot of time talking. And this is something that in, in our times, we are, we are missing quality time talking about this kind of uh, important problems where human societies actually uh, have a huge challenge in front of them if they actually want to uh, keep on going on, on on Earth on a sustainable path. So this is my, this is my view, but I, I, I'm re really happy to uh, see other other thoughts if there is no other questions because for me it's been the highest or the largest uh, uh, lesson learned from the project and honestly I've learned a lot from all the colleagues I learned a lot on, on technical issues but for me this is the major message that I take home from the whole vision or more holistic vision of the of the project. So if any, sorry, I just was working out, but if anybody else wants to contribute to this, I mean, um, Stefano, Toma, Ferdinando, Andre, anybody, Sandrine that is there, um, if you have uh, other visions on integration that we've been talking a lot about this, but uh, if you have any other ideas or thoughts to be shared, 
Go ahead. I may want to add something. I mean, Ferdinando here, I, nice to not meet everyone uh, as usual. But uh, I will just uh, add to what Pepe said that uh, first of all, we should treat ourselves uh, well because uh, as Pepe mentioned, uh, integration is a really difficult issue nightmarish he said and uh, it doesn't have to be nightmarish but the point is this project is really the first baby steps and none of the modelers that we know and we work with uh, have a culture of integration because there has been no um, easy way to implement integration so far so we have given our contribution with with areas and k-lab so that uh, people at least have a strategy and the strategy is by no mean perfect but it's uh, a beginning and uh, and also we had a pandemic, so, so the 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 issue of working in a pandemic, obviously the human you 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 have you have to do without the human contact and the sharing of languages. Which I I don't think we should all speak the same language. By the way, I think it would be good to keep speaking our languages and try to make them understandable to each other. I think it's a much better uh, strategy. But, uh, but um, we also should remind ourselves that in a situation like this, uh, like 10 years ago, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And uh, we are all sick and tired of uh, Zoom meetings and all that kind of stuff, but we should actually be recognizant of the fact that it's been saving a whole lot of potential progress that we were able to actually do despite these very difficult situations. So I am kind of uh, positive about uh, having had the chance to still move on and get to, a, I think, a very decent uh, uh, end, at least uh, the beginning of a first uh, milestone, and I hope there will be many others. But uh, on the issue of integration, we should be very nice to ourselves because integration is extremely difficult and we have not been trained for integration. There's been no integration in any project ever so far. So what we have done is uh, the beginning of uh, a new uh, view of looking at uh, collaboration and at looking at uh, uh, integ integrated and, um, and multidisciplinary science which uh, in, has been tried, attempted, like for probably all of my career in many very ways and always failed. I don't think this time it has failed. So I would like to pat everybody virtually on the back because uh, we did achieve something and we have a beginning and I hope it's not an end. And uh, I think we achieved uh, very good levels of integration. I think we can be proud. I hate the, the word pride having lived 15 years in the US, but they basically think it's a virtue, but, uh, but I think we should be proud of ourselves in, in having achieved at least some of that because it's an extremely difficult task. And I think we did uh, a good job there. Somebody's clapping. I always clapping. Uh... It may be typing. <laughs> Anything else to add to that question? Is there anything else on the chat that we... Yeah, uh, Jose Manuel, who is something there? Francisco Martínez-Cabel, uh, la enhorabuena al equipo del proyecto por el trabajo, que es un proyecto uh, interesante y muy, un reto, y un gran reto. Aquí podemos abrir un poco uh, la perspectiva de, como es un reto, tiene horizontes abiertos, ¿no? ¿Hacia dónde apuntamos ahora? ¿Hacia dónde se apunta en Alice? ¿Qué vamos a hacer? Sí, yo lo repito. So, so basically, Jose uh, is, is bringing up a comment from uh, Francisco Martinez Capel from the University of um, somewhere in Valencia. I can't remember now, uh, Paco. But um, and Jose, won, uh, Paco is uh, congratulating us on 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 the on the project, on the achievement of the project, and he is uh, somehow suggesting what are, what might be the next challenges or the next steps um, from from uh, Alice. Um, I mean, Jose is trying to formalize that as a question. So what, what might be the next, the next challenges? Uh, maybe we need to think about this um, uh, and maybe we could go for the nearest speakers and see what, how they see them, how they see them. One, one thing that I have to add in here is that uh, here in Cantabria, and I will just summarize our, our next challenge is, most of the results from Alice are going to get part of uh, of um, some um, 
and uh, regional planning. Uh, so that's really good results because it means that the uh, research or uh, um, um, the, uh, Alice is going to have a, a translation into some management plans at the region. So that's that's really good, I believe. I think it's, it's a, a, really, a really nice result. And and yes, uh, we we will just be working on that on the on the on the proximate future in the in the next months as well, and also trying to uh, materialize all the the different resources that we have, which is a huge database, on uh, on papers, on trying to, to try to write up most of the stuff that we've been generating because there is a lot of stuff that hasn't been uh, um, published out there yet. So we will concentrate on 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 that in the next next months. What about the others? Um, I'm waiting for more comments. Just one question to. Espera un poco, Jose, porque Toma tiene. Toma, Toma, go ahead. Uh, I think that one of the remaining challenges in Addis or after Addis would be uh, to transfer this knowledge because we produce a lot of knowledge. We share this knowledge with the stakeholders, of, I would say, part of them. And I think that if we want this policy to be well accepted, um, and maybe any kind of uh, economic constraint that would be suggested uh, after Alice, it could be even more better accepted if we transfer this knowledge to locals, inhabitants, to any kind of decision makers in order to increase the awareness about the future, the, ch the challenge of the future. So, well, I, I, I think there is a, a huge step to do uh, from scientists to better communicate about this uh, this type of results because scientific publication are not read by stakeholders. So we have to, to make a, a step forward in this uh, transfer of knowledge in, in order to make things more uh, concrete, I think. But. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Yeah, publishing probably is not the main aim of this project, I would say, given that it is an interreg and a cooperation project. What we really wanted to do was to bring tools uh, to decision makers. Uh, and we are a little, we, there, we still need to do some work on that because uh, the, all the outputs that we have produced are mainly accessible to modelers and we need to make them more available to decision makers. But we had, we have done a great work in automatizing a lot of uh, integration among modeling components. Uh, from the modeling perspective, I would say that we, uh, we can still improve uh, some pieces, like we can incorporate uh, better those models that are now only loosely coupled. So the hydrological part can be uh, better integrated and uh, water temperature in reverse model, uh, it's also important to integrate that one. Uh, and we are not far away uh, from, from finishing that part. So I'm very, very optimistic. To those, those, those challenges also, I think um, what you have to just say is really important. I mean, we were trying to demonstrate that this was possible. Um, so that was the... the We've been running fast <laughs> to, to accomplish that mission, and I think we, we've done it. Um, and now we just need to uh, maybe concentrate on how we're going to communicate. Our experience here in Cantabria, I think it might help a lot to see how we can translate all those things into uh, a different type of information for, for the decision makers here at the regional scale, and that might help. I know Sandrine and Thomas, you're really close to all the, all the water agencies and all the stakeholders in your case study, so I think that also might help a lot um, to see what are, you know, which kind of um, information is actually relevant for the stakeholders and how that could be translated into, um, uh, into decision-making information, which is a, is a really important step. So there are two more comments on the on the chat uh, in English the, the English chat. Uh, Diane uh, Burgess, one of the partners of Northern Ireland of the project, congratulates and, and make a more than an, a comment and opinion on how the model integration in the Northern Ireland case study, for example, working with uh, with the, the consistent service about recreation, identified in the area highlighted areas of potential demand for recreation. So with the with some caveats and limitation, 
they were all the people who work together there to refine that models and reflect the social context. So it's necessary not only integrating models, but also the socio-economical part of the system that we will that will be uh, discussed tomorrow. And also, Josep Anton Morgi uh, give us the congratulations for the advances advances that, that we have. Uh, gathered here in this project and they, uh, he expects to have continuity and the management, uh, the, the policy part of the system was happy with the, with the advances. So thank you, thank you very much. So there are no more uh, comments. Um, I know somebody wants to, I, I would like only to just continue the discussion until at least uh, reaching the, the time. One question to Thomas and Sandrine because we have been just working in the landscape uh, part with the, as Thomas explained, with uh, analyzing the past for forecasting future in terms of landscape dynamics. Then we, in the middle, were working within that patterns, trying, we are now the, trying to disentangle how that landscape patterns, as I try to explain, relate to biodiversity pattern, the potential the biodiversity patterns, as Andrew explained. And then the, the, the team from France has done an amazing work. I've read the papers, and they're amazing, some of them. Mu much more will come. With the real biodiversity information, with the local scale, understanding actually what is going on at the, at the landscape level in terms of biodiversity with in situ data um, and trying to, to connect that big landscape scale with the real in situ data. So what do you think, Sandrine? Once we have already, at the end, the habitat maps and so on, uh, do you think that we, we, we will be able to advance using the ALICE information a little bit more in connecting this landscape scale with the biodiversity, uh, using remote sensing and in-situ data and so on? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. I think, um, uh, as I've mentioned, the, the, probably the habitat mapping that is already available is perhaps um, at a too low resolution to really reflect the biodiversity that is uh, occurring in, in the field. Um, and uh, there's also some work to do on, uh, on the real biodiversity to, to assess also the, the ecological interest of this biodiversity, which has uh, not been done yet on the, on the data set we, uh, we collected. Uh, I think that, in fact, with remote sensing, probably there, there can be uh, some additional uh, index that we can find. So either linked with this uh, sort of uh, functional groups that I mentioned, and that can perhaps be closer to a real interest uh, in terms of biodiversity. It can be also perhaps um, using a combination of, uh, of metrics that could also assess the real biodiversity. And uh, we, we have a, a work ongoing with uh, Laurence Hubermois and, uh, and Sébastien Rapinel, so the colleagues from CNRS, for um, finding such metrics uh, that could um, reflect the, the biodiversity, so by uh, validating these uh, metrics with uh, the real data set. So, in fact, the, the first step is habitat mapping, and it's already very uh, a good, uh, a nice advance in the in the field. And the, and the, the good point is that we can uh, exploit them at a large scale. So it's really important to to reach this point. And it is great to, to have this uh, already done. And then now uh, it's still uh, in, the, in the research side. Uh, side. We, we need to go on on, uh, on um, complementing this work with uh, other metrics. And uh, probably uh, we can add some, some, some of them to, to precise, to refine the, the assessment. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question. Yes, for... Um, for, me, for, for Ferdinando and, and Stefano, uh, again, talking about the model integration and, and so on, from Francisco Martinez Capel, uh, tells that uh, it sounds great, all the advances, and, uh, but there is a question about the uh, modeling techniques in relating to the using KLAB uh, in comparison with other online platforms for modeling. So the KLAB looks very interesting for different aspects of reverse ecology and future research. But the question is like how KLAB goes a little bit more far away uh, in comparison or not, in comparison to other modeling platforms. Do you really want an answer to this? Are you serious? 
<laughs> yeah, that's a question, Ferdinando. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer it in, a, in, any, in any amount of time, but uh, the point is, what are the other modeling platforms? I mean, if you're looking at uh, things that expose an API from which you can drive a simulation, like, uh, I don't know, open CPU, these kind of things, uh, the, that, the, although those things are good, uh, the point is uh, there is no other platform that, in, that is meant for integration. As far as I know, at least. If you know of one, please let me know because that'd be nice. But um, what what we do is not to put models on the web. What we do is to uh, enable users to uh, develop models that can be put on the web and uh, uh, talk to each other. And I don't think there is any other platform that that, is, that does that. This is highly experimental in many ways. So, and uh, as as everybody who has uh, suffered through it. Uh, uh, can attest uh, it is not an easy task as we always say integration is a two-way street and you need to know what you are integrating and you need to design your models and your projects in order for them to be integrated what KLab does is to create a, a protocol for doing that, exactly that other platforms can put, a, put maybe a model on the web so that you can use a website and click run and uh, that is a completely different concept. Uh, so this is the main difference uh, if the question was about differences. Now, if the question is about, is about opportunities, I think uh, Alba's presentation, for example, was very um, telling in, the, in, in defining what the potential differences are. Uh, you take a model which is uh, very hard to read and very complicated and it's a very long uh, set of uh, instructions that can only run uh, next to each other and you turn it into uh, several dozen little statements that can run independently and uh, the system can uh, choose which one of them uh, is the best for each particular purpose and you can add uh, one way of observing a particular concept that is in there and put it on your machine and from that point on that single component of the model will run your way and everything else will still run the rest of the model these kind of things are new and uh, they've been sought after for a long time and uh, i've been part of a lot of unsuccessful projects that try to do that and that's why i now can lead a project that can actually try and do it. But um, there is really no comparison with this. So I get a lot of questions of uh, what this model uh, compared to that model, etc. The point is, uh, this is one uh, way of uh, giving models a longer life uh, and uh, a way to be part of an ecosystem. And uh, I don't think there is another. And if there is another, great, uh, that, that we can all learn from each other. But uh, it is not a fair comparison to uh, to put this against any other uh, thing that just can put a computation on the web because it's not uh, the entire point there. So it's the point of KLab is integration more than modeling. And then modeling is a consequence of having succeeded in integrating. And that's probably the, the answer, although I'm sure that whoever asked the question wasn't expecting an answer like this, but that's uh, <laughs> another problem we have to deal with a lot of times. Thank you very much, Ferdinando, uh, for your comprehensive uh, view of the modeling environment and world and, and so on. So the last question, and Pepe will close with a comment for tomorrow, uh, but I think it's, it's a very good question for end, ending up with the session of today. Robin uh, asks, uh, who are the customers for the modeling applications when they are developed to a usable level? So who are the end users of the applications that Alice has been developed and will develop in hopefully in the near future. So Pepe, you can answer this question briefly and close with the comment for tomorrow and, well, and thank you to I, I don't know if I can answer to that question really. <laughs> um, we had a lot of models on the table. Uh, I think I think maybe I, I need to handle this to, to Stefano probably or some others. Toma, uh, I mean, the, my view is that any anybody with a little bit of interest can use these things we have tried as we say before we we try to uh, integrate different visions with vi different modeling strategies and different um, tools um, but we need to refine um, how though that information can actually reach to uh, to the all of the scales of knowledge of people that you know from the decision making to PhD students to lecturers to 
consultants, and I think we didn't get quite that yet, as, 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 they, were, as they were saying before. But we, as Stefan, as Ferdinando said before, I, I think we just having the um, first baby steps into this, and I think it, it is the way to go. So basically, mm -hmm. this is my this is my thing. Stefano, do you have anything any view there? Yeah, yeah. I obviously have a, <laughs> a very big vision. I think the the best thing to say in in regards to this is that we need to democratize the science. We need to make science more available to to everybody, to citizens, obviously to decision makers. I think you you sold this technology, this package uh, of uh, results to the regional authority of Cantabria in a way because they are interested in using science to take better decisions, no? That's the idea. So, so that is uh, one possible category of users, but uh, like the Cantabrian region, there might be other uh, stakeholders needing science to take better decisions for sustainability. And, uh, and uh, I mean, the sky is the limit. I think, I think we are at the same stage as we were with the encyclopedias uh, 15 years ago, when we stopped uh, using encyclopedias and 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 contributing, for example, to Wikipedia and using Wikipedia to make um, knowledge more available to everybody, uh, now we are talking about scientific knowledge and uh, and models and data and Earth observation and I mean the best knowledge available out there. And this is what we're uh, that we we. And, and, about, and, about, and about the good thing that you guys say in the statement is that democratize, democratize science. So we, we, we use one of the uses for this were the, the, the stakeholders participating in each case study so that they were informed and they could actually take decisions. Um, I think that's a key. Uh, it's a key issue. I mean, the information needs to flow to all different uh, societal levels, uh, not only decision makers, but every everybody else that is interested in on, on participating in these in these discussions and in this. Uh, I think I think we need to move into another way of how we take decisions. Uh, no voting politicians every four years, and that's it. You have you know you can do whatever you want, and we'll see you next in the next four years. Uh, it's more about uh, an ongoing process, an ongoing decision making process informed by technique uh, knowledge, the best available. And this is what we are. We're trying to produce this, I think. This is what we are at the moment. Yeah, I would like just yes, uh, asking you, Thomas, uh, because your stakeholder workshop participation has been the, the, maybe the most uh, that, that, that went more far away with a lot of scenarios and discussions. Yes, a few words for closing this. How do you feel that workshop with the stakeholder elicitation processes uh, worked. How Alice uh, has been into their lives? Ah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, honestly, I would say that the, the final workshop has not been set yet. It is in two in ten days, so there is a life be, be, be after Alice. But um, we have we had very recently some feedbacks from our main partner about the, these results and. There, there, I think there are uh, controversial feelings and understandings because I think that we have been able to show main trends, main future stakes, main issues in a broad sense. And now, because they know very well their, uh, their study sites, their, uh, their territories, they need to, to refine every, uh, all the kind of results that we have provided. Because, of course, uh, the environmental evaluation is not well adapted for each case study, but we have a broad overview about what could be the trends or the future impact. So now we have to refine in order to, to maybe to fine tune what could be the leverage uh, in terms of uh, policies that could be well adapted for the local stakeholders. And, but basically, I, I think that the, one of the big uh, uh, understanding is that they can disentangle the effect of climate change and land use and land cover changes. And it is always a tricky question, even for scientists. And now we can better uh, identify what could be the effect of climate change and what could be the effect of land use and land cover change uh, separately and combined. 
And I think it is really important to, 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 to keep that in mind and at least contribute to, to, to this, uh, yeah, to this broad knowledge and to, to, yeah, to have a more integrated uh, uh, point of view of all these uh, environmental issues. So I, I would say that maybe stakeholders have been maybe too deeply into one environmental issue like, uh, like water resources. And now they have a, a broader overview about uh, the impact of their land management policies in, in regards to different environmental issues like biodiversity, um, like uh, uh, soil erosion, and so on. So I think it is uh, a good, a good, uh, a good point for the Alice. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, I think we need to cut now. We got we are ten minutes over the limit, and the translators are already quite tired. So we need to move into uh, into the next day, day two. Um, I'll invite you all the people that have assisted, please, to come back tomorrow. Um, there will be just a little bit more of Alice, and it will be really interesting because we will be uh, looking at. Uh, participatory learning approaches that we have developed or participatory processes is the social part really important uh, in order to actually design begins and, and having a sense of what what, what is the what, what is what we 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 achieve in the territory actually uh, we will have also the application of begins and the and some examples for the four case studies so please uh, don't miss this there are really interesting results here um, what are people willing to pay or not for begins. Uh, we have some approximations there. We have uh, begins designed. We have um, a lot of stories, nice stories tomorrow. And just one thing, just one important message. We won't be starting at 10. We will be starting at 10.20 uh, 10 because we missed the first, uh, the first talk. We didn't manage to get um, the support from, 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 from some people that we invited, but uh, we will start a little bit uh, later at 10.20, right? So if you want to connect at 10, that's fine. We will be around, um, um, but, and, and we will see you tomorrow, all, hopefully. Um, it's been a pleasure to have, see you all your faces. It's a shame that we cannot go for lunch now together, but please do have a nice lunch and maybe a beer at night. I will be doing that anyway. So. Good to see you all. <laughs>